Is there enough caring? Is there enough love? Is there enough values in the world that we can deflect some of these terrible trends that are happening? I don't know, but let's put it loose and find out. And I know for sure, if we don't dig down to that part of us that knows how to care and to organize our behavior around it, we for sure will not succeed with these challenges we have in front of us worldwide. You're listening to Dr. Stephen Hayes on Psychologists Off the Clock. We are three clinical psychologists committed to cutting-edge, integrative, and evidence-based strategies for living well. On this podcast, we bring you ideas from psychology that can help you flourish in your work, parenting, relationships, and health. I am Dr. Diana Hill, practicing in Seaside, Santa Barbara, California. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado. And from coast to coast, I'm Dr. Yael Schoenbrunn, a Boston-based clinical psychologist and assistant professor at Brown University. We hope this podcast offers you ideas for how to live a full and meaningful life. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. Hi, folks. As you'll hear in today's episode, ACT is experiential. So come experience some ACT with us. On September 8th, a Sunday, I'll be conducting a workshop at Yoga Soup in Santa Barbara, where we'll take a deep dive into committed action and behavior change. And then on Saturday, October 19th in Goleta, California, Debbie is going to be meeting up with me and we're going to be at the Mindful Outdoor Retreats uh, Day Retreat up at Goodland Organics Coffee Farm, where we'll experience yoga and coffee and sound healing and some workshops with Debbie and myself, and a full day of mindfulness and rest. So come join us. We look forward to seeing you. You can check out more at my website, drdianahill.com. Today we have Dr. Stephen C. Hayes on the show for his third time, and there is good reason for that. He's author of 44 books and nearly 600 scientific articles. He's also the developer of relational frame theory and the co-developer of acceptance and commitment therapy, or ACT, which is a therapy that is really near and dear to Debbie, Yael, and my hearts. You've probably heard a lot about it if you're a listener to this show. It's an evidence-based approach that's really been growing in evidence over the last few decades. And Dr. Hayes was listed by the Institute for Scientific Information as the 30th highest impact psychologist in the world. And Google Google Scholar data ranks him among the top 1,500 most cited scholars in all areas of study. And Diana, your interview with him in this episode is about his brand new book, which is called A Liberated Mind, How to Pivot Toward What Matters. And we're going to be having a giveaway on the show. All you have to do is three things. One, go to Apple Podcasts and write us a review. Two, share this episode on social media. And then three, go to our website, contact us with that little email button up in the corner and let us know what you did. And you'll be entered into a drawing that ends on September 15th for a free liberated mind. We'll be sending it out to five randomly selected listeners. So go ahead, take a listen, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Steve Hayes, you pulled it off. Congratulations. You've managed to do what some of us thought might have been impossible. I've attended a lot of trainings with ACT gurus, and every one of them has left me just wanting to live more courageously and fully and align with my values. It's sort of like a deep tissue massage that you get in there. It hurts so much, but in such a good way. And up until now, I thought it would be pretty much impossible for an ACT book to give you that same level, that same visceral experience, but a liberated mind does it. It's personal, it's convincing scientifically, it's experiential, it's practical, and it's a deep tissue massage for the soul. So it goes to show what what can happen if an ACT co-founder leaves it all on the table. And today we get to share it with the world. It's out today. And Psychologist Off the Clock is really honored to be a small part of that. Thank you for coming on the show. That's well, really, really, really glad to be here with you. And, and your opening comments are kind of uh, 
stunning uh, for me. And uh, after a, an 11 year journey, it's uh, fun to actually be at this point where I can hear words like it's out today. And, uh, and the deep tissue massage, I, I, one of my uh, career alternatives early on was to be a chiropractor. So I guess I'm just going to do a little psychological chiropractic maybe here uh, through pages of a book. Exactly. That's what ACT does. So let's start with why we need this book. Uh, you write in The Liberated Mind that we've made incredible progress in terms of physical health over the last 50 years, but that's not the case for our mental health. Can you talk about the state of affairs of our mental health and why is ACT the solution? Yeah, it's mental health and even more broadly, just being able to prosper uh, behaviorally, even amidst physical prosperity. And I think it's because our science and technology, which is the fruits of our development culturally and cognitively, have now fed us a constant diet of exposure to pain and comparison uh, and judgment. And those three are toxic uh, if you mishandle them. And it's moving everything in the wrong direction. Our young people are showing higher rates of uh, anxiety, stress, and all that. And, and it's not just, though they're re- answering the self-reports different. No, people are dying. The, the frequency of suicide, especially among young people, is going up. And there's just something deep, deeply wrong. I think we all sense it. And the book walks through why and what to do about it. Why is ACT the solution? Like, what, what is the evidence that ACT could even work with some of this stuff? Well, I, I think ACT, qua ACT, you know, as a set of, if you think of it as a set of techniques, is probably not, quote, the solution. It's not hardly a panacea. But the model, we spent so much time working on the model. I and mean, it's not just sort of out in the field, abstract theorizing. We kind of dug down to what is the 20% that does the 80%. What are the processes of change? The ways that you interact with your the world outside and within that makes a profound difference as to whether or not your life is moving upward or downward. And we've settled into six processes that are all interrelated. They're like six sides of a box. They fit together. They support each other. You really can't understand them unless they're all in a relationship like that. I think why it might be not the solution, but a really powerful way forward anywhere that a human mind goes is that we've taken the time to put Western science to this issue. We've pulled it at its joints, and we discover in there are things that are resonant with our wisdom traditions, our spiritual traditions, our psychotherapy traditions, but yet presented now in this new way that allows you to focus on the immediate changes that you can make, and there's only six things you have to remember, and if you do those things and you make progress on those things, life starts opening up, and that's just a really cool place to be able to say, not just that, oh, do things that monks were doing a thousand years ago and so forth, which is great, it's fine, but to pull it at its joints and get it so simplified that you can put it on the factory floor, you can put it into your kitchen, you can put it into this interview, you can put it into your life. So I want to walk through each of those six points, but before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about what we've been doing instead of those six points. So the real premise of your work is that a lot of the problems that we have psychologically are due to our emotional rigidity and emotional avoidance. Let's start there. That's a pivotal one. It's one of the most obvious ones for many people. What we have allowed is we've fed this more problem-solving mode of mind that we have and is useful and is helpful for fixing your car, doing your taxes or figuring out, uh, you know, how to do the wonderful inventions that are now challenging us with exposure to pain, comparison and judgment. Um, You know, when you take that mode of mind and bring it to your own felt sense, your memories, your bodily sensations, your feelings, your emotions, the logical, reasonable, sensible and pathological thing to do, is to say, oh, I only want the good ones. You know, I want to feel. That's a basic yearning. I mean, kids come into the world reaching out for things, putting them in their mouth, you know, just to be able to touch, to feel, to smell, to lick, to engage with is something that we don't have to be taught. We come into the world that way. Good thing. We've got so many things to learn. But the, when the judgmental mode of mind comes in, it starts saying, yeah, I get, you want to feel, and here's the way to do it. You only feel good stuff. Sugar soup. It should always be nice. Well, 
feelings don't come packaged that way. And so you start avoiding your own emotions. And initially it feels good to do that because you avoid the painful ones, you seek out the positive ones. But over time, what we found, and some of this is since ACT began, I mean, I've been surprised by the literature and going, oh my God, this is much worse than I thought. You actually start avoiding joy too. We begin to engage with our own emotions as something that's a threat to us rather than a source of wisdom to us as our past echoes into the present and gives us little hints and warnings about things that are safe or opportunities that are here. And if you dumb all that down, you've dumbed your life down in a way that is going to make it harder and harder for you to navigate the challenges, but also see the opportunities. You'll, you'll avoid stepping forward into that new job or relationship or hobby or you know, where initially you're going to feel uncomfortable, but long term you might engage with what you really, really want to have in your life. So the inflexibility process of experiential avoidance is the problem-solving mind basically telling you that what you need to do is figure out how to have only good feelings. Mm-hmm. And, and we're fed that, right? We're fed problem solve, self-soothe, positive thinking, try to change your thoughts. And these are some of the, the tricks of actually psychology. And I've been in, I've kind of done that sometimes with my clients or gotten in those traps. And I know you did that for yourself with, you talk about that with your own sure. anxiety. Can you talk a little bit about the tricks and that you tried and, and how they didn't work for you? Let me start this with the ones that uh, listeners may have tried. I mean, if you just take almost any, per, you know, just go through any bookstore or or just get online and look at the ones that are relevant and then look at the titles and what are they promising? You know, an agent or somebody will always say, you want to write a book, you have to have a promise. You know, what's the promise? And it's often you're going to feel good. You're going to get rid of that. And it's going to be all positive. You know, it doesn't come packaged that way. It's so unwise. And so, yeah, well, I mean, I, for example, really worked hard. You're talking to a panic disordered person in recovery. I say in recovery because, you know, I never say never. I've learned that whatever emotions I have, including really strong waves of anxiety, may come again. That's fine. I'm not going to make that my problem. I had my early spiral down into anxiety and panic. You know, I did, for example, um, relaxation tapes. There's a lot of data that relaxation can be helpful. Yes, but relaxation is training and letting go. But it turns into training and how to fight anxiety with this new thing. And in the earliest work, that's not what it was. Muscle relaxation was learning how to let go. There's a whole thing of you you can't make your muscles relax. You can also only let go of making your muscles tense. And there's a deep wisdom in that. So we've we've turned even the things that are evidence-based into yet another attempt. I'm afraid we're doing it with mindfulness right now. Selfish forms of mindfulness, escapist form of mindfulness. I mean, this is not what's in the traditions, but Western culture can do Right, it. or in a kid's classroom where they're using mindfulness to control their unruly kids. Everybody get down and be mindful. There's yeah, danger exactly. in that, right? <laughs> you know? Exactly. You know, mindfulness you, is a punishment. <laughs> you, have to, you used to have to sit in the corner silently, and now you sit on your little pillow silently. And breathe deeply. <laughs> and breathe deeply. You know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you don't want to get too extreme on it because these things are – contain things that are helpful. All of them do. I mean, self-soothing, getting in a hot tub and watching a movie you really like, it's all fine. But you have to know the game you're playing. And if you're Mm -hmm. playing an avoidance game, the most positive technique you can think of is going to turn around and bite you in the rear end because sooner or later, you're going to ask that kind of, am I there yet? Am I there yet? And the answer is going to be no, because right inside the question is this anxious fear that anxiety might show up. And so the anxiety itself becomes something to be anxious about. Right. If you don't want to have it, you will. This is one yeah. of your famous quotes. Another one of the things that you're promoting out there is this hashtag, we hurt where we care. Yeah. We hurt where we care. And this this comes from the premise that it's not only is it ineffective to try and fight our thoughts and feelings, but 
we lose a great deal of information and meaning when we do so. You teach us that it's important for us to look at the messages and meanings inside our pain. You know, there's many ways to really connect with what you deeply care about. One of the really immediate ones when people are struggling is the flip side of their own pain. And I ask people literally to write down in a few words what they're really struggling with. And then to turn the page over and write down, what does that suggest you deeply care about? For example, if you've been wounded in love, and who hasn't been? If you've been betrayed or found unwanted or turned away from, lied to, who hasn't had that happen to them? And it just cuts you like a knife. And what your mind tells you is, I will never be so vulnerable again. You know, what that means is you're not going to be woundable. What that means is you're not going to be close because when people are close to you, they can wound you. Even if they don't do it intentionally, they might die and you're going to feel abandoned. You're going to be hurt so deeply when that happens. And you know that you're just a car accident away from people who you love disappearing from your life. Better not to love at all. That's safer. That's what the mind does. It kind of flips pain over into seeking out numbing and waiting for life to be over. If instead you flip it over and say, what does that suggest I deeply care about? And then would I, would I, would I be willing to not be dominated by the pain, but to use it kind of like a flashlight into the darkness of, oh, okay, I get it. I really want intimate, committed relationships that are, that are loyal and sustaining. That's what I really want. That's why that betrayal hurts so bad. Mm -hmm. And not take that next logical, reasonable, sensible, and pathological thing of, and I'm going to defend myself against that by detuning my relationships. Debbie and I were talking about my anxiety about doing this interview with you and getting the book read in time. And, and then Debbie texted me saying, I'm anxious because you're anxious, Diana. I'm feeling anxious for you. And then I texted her back and said, Debbie, that's the biggest compliment I've ever received because you must really love me. <laughs> <laughs> you hurt because you care, right? Exactly. And that's what's behind that anxiety. Too. Yeah, and I bet if you flipped anxiety over, it's that you see an opportunity to maybe serve your audience and to help people. Exactly. And you know, you've read a book that you are feeling pretty positively about and you think, man, if, if people would read it, that would be helpful. You know, they're like, and that yearning is right inside. Oh, God, what if we screw this up really badly? We miss this opportunity. That would be, you know, and isn't it always like that? And is that your enemy? Really? You can dumb yourself down enough that you can almost not feel what you feel. Alexithymia, I don't even know what I'm feeling. What does it further predict? More pain. Imagine just thinking about the sen sensory organs on the tips of your fingers. If you reach out and feel the desk in front of you, for example, then over here there's like a, a hot plate for your coffee and you slide over and now you feel that, you know, you're going to move away quickly from that hot plate. Well, could you design feelers so that you only feel the smooth part, but you don't feel the hot part, the rough part, the, the prickly part, the cutting part? No, you can't. You can't. Your fingertips are going to feel both, or they wouldn't be able to serve you. You would, you know, like you don't want fingertips where if you put your finger in the fire or put it in the car door, it doesn't give you information. It only gives you information when you're feeling your satin sheets. And that's tantamount to what the mind's telling you you need to do to solve the problem of feeling. No, the challenge of feeling, the yearning for feeling can be only be solved healthily by learning how to be more open to your feelings. And you need other flexibility processes because you can't just do that. You have to know how to put that in a larger stream so that you can shift attention, you can focus on behavior. You don't want to just wallow in feelings from morning to night, good or bad. There's other things to do in life. Now, liberated mind, you, you talk about this concept of a pivot. And you state that dramatic change is possible and it's not that far away. And you also share that just like pivoting on the ball of your foot, psychological pivoting is both effortless and a skill that takes practice to learn. So as we enter into the, the six processes that you outline so beautifully in this book, can we just start with this concept of pivoting? At our worst, our kind of bad answers are bad answers to the right question. So the concept of pivoting is even your mistakes are your ally. 
Because inside there is information about what you need and want that you can use to build a life worth living. When you take that energy, you, you come to kind of see how you've allowed the problem-solving mind to narrow you down. And then the metaphor of pivot comes from the name for the pin and the hinge, a French word, is that we'll take the energy that's going one direction and you'll swing it out in another direction that expands out our lives. And I show in the book how to do that. You break it down in the book so that we learn each of the steps separately so that then we can do the dance together. So like if you're learning, you know, learning a dance, you do each step separately. And the steps are these six core processes. So we have diffusion, which is all about distancing ourselves from our thoughts or creating a little space from our thoughts, putting our thoughts on a leash. There's the self, which you describe as the art of perspective taking. The third is acceptance, which is learning from pain. The fourth is presence, how to live in the now. The fifth is values, caring by choice. And then the last is action, which is committing to change. So those are the the pivot points that you break down in the book. And I think it would be helpful for our listeners just to get a little more experience and feeling around what, what it feels like to pivot into one of these processes. The purpose of the pivot, if we're going to be using the metaphor of a dance, the pivot is sort of like the swinging round and the the energy that allows you to swing around is, mm. is a, a, a critical part of knowing that you're now moving in the right direction. What we're moving towards is actually that underlying yearning that was right inside the things that most screwed up our lives and that can be inside, but but wasn't really satisfied. This is the thing about when we're doing things that are pathological for us is we're yearning for something and it looks like we're getting it. And it's always this trick where this immediate effect is positive and the long-term effect is negative. Like when I was struggling with anxiety and said, oh, no, no, I won't give a talk. Uh, I'll, I'll have my graduate students do that. And, and I'm telling stories about how I'm a good mentor because I help my graduate students get their V to build because I give them important talks to give. And, you know, and as I turn down that talk, I immediately feel like, whew, boy, that's a lot better. I don't have to give it. A, I feel relieved. Yeah. But now anxiety is a bigger part of my life, more you know, the dictator within is dominating me more and so forth. So life's getting getting worse. So the energy that's inside the list you just made is this yearning to feel, the yearning for coherence and understanding, the yearning for orientation, knowing just where I am, mm-hmm. the yearning for belonging and, and connection, the yearning for self-directed meaning, and the yearning for competence. And those six yearnings are great guide. So in that example of graduate students where you're doing this, what we described before, this emotional avoidance of why don't you guys do the talk? I'm just going to step out for this one. And your mind could tell a story that would make rational sense as to why you're not doing it. And you feel that relief. Give me like, what would a pivot look like there? How would you use one of these six processes with that? Or probably many of the six, but. Yeah, well, let's say, okay, let's say inside that talk is the opportunity to do something that I deeply care about. And let's say this is a talk where I might be able to talk about uh, psychological matters that could be of deep usefulness to, to people. And I'm a psychologist that I really care about that. You know, I came here to do something uh, with regard to human suffering. And maybe I even have some skills there. I have some competence. I have some things that I know. I have some things I could do in that talk that might move some people. So could I take the uh, that energy of a feeling that's being mishandled, that's preventing me from contacting these energies of self-directed meaning and competence, and instead open up to my feelings and and give myself kind of a a way forward that would be something like this. I'm going to do the very best I can delivering something that's useful to people here to actually serve them. That's my deep value. And my focus in doing that is is going to be, as I give that talk, to stay as emotionally open as I can so that I can do a little better job of learning how to feel fully and without needless defense. And so... I could carry maybe 
that energy. You mentioned anxiety earlier. What it would be like if we we're anxious about this interview and could carry our anxiety into attention towards things like, is Steve going on too long? Am I losing the audience? Is that clear? Did I actually use an example that lands well? Do we have enough time to cover the things that we want to cover? That's a good place to put anxiety. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you're about to give an important talk, you want that energy. There's actually data on that. People don't give as good a talk if they don't have that energy that's right on that edge of oh, what if I mess it up. Right. I, Therapists aren't as good unless they have a little self-doubt. There's some data yeah. on that too, right? And so so what you're describing there is uh using the acceptance skill of or the yes. acceptance process of of moving in. You're describing also um, so that opening up, you're also describing values as where we're orient. That's what's orienting us. Mm -hmm. And then you're also doing a little bit of this, this concept of cognitive diffusion or, or, or choosing our thoughts. Can you talk about that, that component of the process? Well, that one's a really important one because if you unpack, you know, if you take that immediate one of, you know, anxiety, et cetera, but you unpack why that's hard. Well, that goes back to what I was saying at the beginning. It's because the problem-solving mind dominates over us. And that problem-solving mind, I, I use the metaphor of the dictator within, that little voice that's constantly telling us to do this or do that, or we did it wrong. It's criticizing, judging, cajoling, encouraging, you know, bossing us uh, around. And, uh, you know, what, what the energy that's in there is yearning to understand. The problem is, is that literal understanding in the sense of everything all figured out in that nice, neat in a row, that's a fool's errand. Our mind is full of things that are contradictory. You've got prejudiced thoughts in you. You've got, you know, horrible kinds of uh, advice from uh, people who didn't know how to live their life well. And it's going to bounce around in your head. You may even have a parent who told you things that you know in hindsight this is not wise and you can see in their life it's not wise but you early on were taught it and if it's not just your parents it's the television screen and it's your peers and it's your siblings and it's it's the magazines it's all around us and once in it's in if you think a thought enough just a few times it's in there for life there's no place else for it to go there's no delete button in the nervous system there's no process called unlearning there's a process called inhibition. That's not the same thing. And so you've got a cacophony of voices. If you ever try to do something like, you know, I'm really a good person, you'll hear a whisper. No, you're not. Oh, but I do so many good things. You're a fraud. You're good, but you did all these other bad things. You know, you can't get away with the simplest thing. So... Here, if we're going to yearn for understanding, which makes sense, we're going to have to find a different kind of understanding that's more like this. It's kind of a humble understanding of these thoughts are helpful to me, and I'm going to put more energy around them. These thoughts, thank you, mind, very much. I'm glad you reminded me of my history. I know you're trying to help me here, but I've got it covered. And I don't think I'm going to do too much with those thoughts. You have to start sorting thoughts into a kind of understanding like, that's like functional understanding. And it'd be sort of like if you were listening to a, a room full of advisors and some of them were really wise and said good things and some of them were, were not so smart. You would learn to attend to the advisors that consistently gave you good advice. And th these are processes that you're saying that we can practice. And in A Liberated Mind, you give specific practices yeah. that the readers can do to strengthen this muscle of paying attention to our thoughts or choosing thoughts. Do yeah. you have an example? Do you have a practice that you could lead me through right sure. now and lead our listeners through? I'll give you a silly one, but then I will give you one that sort of gives you a little sweeter sense to it so you don't think that we're ridiculing your mind or making fun of yourself or not. But if you take a thought right now that penetrates you, that's sort of judgmental and critical, and has been around a long time and you kind of have a sense this is there's not a lot of wonderful life enhancement inside buying into that thought but it it's there it just repeats it shows up at two in the morning when you wake up and you're worried and there it is 
You know, it's almost involuntary. It's habitual. Take one like that. Get clear on it. Settle it down to a very short sentence. And I encourage people actually mentally to do this. Sing it to the tune of Happy Birthday. Just do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fits so well. I'm not doing a good enough job. <laughs> yeah. I'm not doing a good, good job. <laughs> and many more. <laughs> well, the funny ones have that little dangerous thing about ridicule because it's not you're not ridiculous. But I'm just pointing out, just like if you were an actor in a play and you had lines to say, some of these things you know, are so habitual and they may not be help that helpful to you. It, could we just have a little bit of space in practicing something like, for example, singing your thoughts gives you that tiny little space where choice can happen, where you notice that you have a thought. We've shown in studies that people, when they just that little shift of saying, I'm having the thought that, or now I'm thinking that, just that versus just saying the results. Like instead of saying, I'm bad, you say, I'm thinking I'm bad. A, your brain lights up entirely differently. B, it predicts long-term outcomes. It predicts what's going to happen months from now. When you start taking that little chatter that you disappear into in that tiny, tiny, tiny little space, that psychological space of just tagging it as a thought. Mm -hmm. And singing is another little kind of, practice but I, I said i wanted to do something sweet because I, I don't want this message to be that you're ridiculous or, or that you you have to sort of slap your mind around or something and it's very short but just take that very same thought that you just came up with and see if you can find a thought that's kind of like it that you thought even when you were a child could be a teenager Younger, if you can do it. If it's an insecurity thought, or I'm not lovable thought, I'm not good enough thought, I'm not competent, you know, maybe I'll screw it up if it takes us that one. I bet you you can find mm -hmm. even yeah. elementary school, okay? Now take just a moment to picture yourself, what you look like. You have those school pictures. You remember the goofy hair, the goofy shoes, the crazy dress you're wearing. You, can, you remember that. Picture it. Picture that child in front of you. And now hear that thought out of her mouth in a child's voice. Allow yourself actually to hear that same thought. Maybe it's not the exact form as you as an adult. If it was, you know, I'm going to screw up this interview, it might be like, I don't know enough, or I'm not smart enough, and have her say that. And then my question to you is, what would you do if you met yourself at this age? saying that and my guess is you're not going to slap the kid you're not going to wag a finger at the kid you're not going to say what's the matter with you you big baby but you'll do that with yourself in the morning mirror and where did you know self-kindness disappear could we bring it to the morning mirror could we bring it to this interview could we treat ourselves as you know, beings that are in a process of growing and we have a cacophony and some of these voices show up and some of them are really old and take what's useful and re leave the rest. And what useful might be like on this issue of am I smart enough, blah, 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 is let's prepare, do the best job I can. That's great. And then the rest of it of, oh my, uh, 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 that can actually make it hard to remember what the next question is or what the answer was just seconds ago. We'll let go of that part. And how? Maybe by applying that same skill psychologically, metaphorically, that you do to how you'd hug the eight-year-old by being kind to yourself and then bring your attention to this moment. And what's important about that is that I didn't say to her, Oh, but you are, honey. You're fine. It's okay. Don't think that yeah. because that's our that's our tendency, and that's that subtle avoidance, right? The um, the subtle aggression of self improvement. That's the subtle. It's okay. I love but that actually, phrase. I love that. That's kind of that's kind of children right there. Yeah, the subtle aggression of self improvement. But but what it is is, or what I said to her. So my mine is old and it's been around forever, which is I'm not doing a good enough job, which. You know, is rooted and I'm not good enough. And what I said to her 
was, I love you how you are. Yeah. I love you how you are. And it just lands so differently than saying, you know, trying to battle that thought or make excuses for it. And if we could change that, not only in how we relate to ourselves, but how we relate as to our children's parents or how we relate to our colleagues at work or how we relate to our partners, it, it, it's not only in relationship to our own thoughts, but also how we relate, you know, to others as well, this practice of acceptance and compassion. Yeah. Yeah, powerfully. And it's interesting that when you do this just nor- normally, you know not to just sit on criticizing the kid, but even the encouragement thing, of, oh, don't think that, that's not true, etc. You can feel the invalidation in that. And I yeah. love this kind of the little microaggression almost of self-improvement. Yeah. And But here's the this, this sick thing. It's in our self-help books. Oh, yeah. It's in our therapy yes. sessions. Are you kidding yes. me? <laughs> Yes. This is this is the, the Kool Aid we've been feeding getting, people to make them feel better, right? It's exactly yeah. the people getting. Mm-hmm. It's in the titles of the self help right. books. I mean, it, it screams. And of course, normal folks looking to the behavioral sciences and the helping professions. What are they going to think if we're constantly stepping forward with uh, with uh, advice that has a short term pop and a long term abandonment? The power of positive thinking and all of that. I mean, there. Sometimes it's really close to an answer that could work, but often it's feeding cultural beliefs that are actively uh, drawing people into this fish trap of narrow and narrow lives where each little micro step forward feels like it's going to work and then you're abandoned and you feel as though, oh, you're the one who didn't do the secret right so that it brought the, you know, the, the energies to you. You're the one who didn't do the self-affirmations right in such a way that you no longer had self-doubt. You're the one who didn't know how to cognitive reappraise in the way that you no longer had to have negative thoughts. You know, these things are close to things that could work. Reappraisal meaning think more flexibly, sure. Out with the bad, in with the good, bad idea. Bad idea. It's a train wreck. Can we talk a bit about the process of presence, which some may call mindfulness, but sure. as you write in the book, mindfulness in, in a lot of ways has become overused and oversimplified. Sure. And and that that concept of using mindfulness to quiet your kid down or quiet your own anxious thoughts down may not be quite what you're getting at here. So talk about how you approach presence or mindfulness in a liberated mind. Yeah. The, the, you know, mindfulness has been captured by the culture, Western culture, and it's, it's kind of, it has some good, a lot of good things in it and a lot of things in it that are not so good in, in the wisdom traditions they come from teachers, make sure that right action and values are part of it. For example, we put it in the healthcare system. You don't necessarily have to have that conversation. And so we, they make sure that we're not doing things for selfish reasons. I mean, you take care of the kids. I've got to go meditate. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Have, no. Um, so the, the, there's four flexibility processes that together kind of, I think, capture mindfulness pretty well. This transcendent sense of self or observing or perspective taking part that's more emotionally and cognitively flexible and able to allocate attention to the present moment in a way that's flexible, fluid, and voluntary. Those four things kind of make it up. And, you know, I think what's a little difference, different is that because we've dug down to the processes, we're not committed to only a particular way. So, for example, you don't have to do contemplative practice as the only way. And, you know, John Kabat-Zinn is a personal friend. And when, but when I was talking to him years ago about his work, I said, do you, two questions. Do you care more about the educated elite or everybody, including Joe Sixpack? And he said, everybody. And I said, do you care more about the methods or the process? He said, the process. I said, I'm with you then, John. I'm with you. I wrote a blog uh, recently on kind of a, a wacky, thing and I got criticized pretty hard for it. I said, okay, you, you can't stand meditating. You just can't do it to kind of have a practice. Here's something you can do over the next two minutes. Put it in your day a couple times. Just for 30 seconds, do something very slowly and just notice what you're doing. You know, I mean, if, if you're eating your salad, 
just for 30 seconds, suddenly that fork is going to take 15 seconds to get to your mouth. That chew is going to take twice as long or three times as long. Try it. Just do it. And what you'll catch is there's an awareness that shows up, and you begin to notice things. You know, the, the life unfolding in the moment shows up. Now, is that uh, a meditation? Is that a concern? I don't know. I'm not trying to displace anything. But we have scores of these tiny little micro methods of attentional flexibility and showing up in the present that you can deploy in, the, in your day. And Joe Sixpack could do it. And yet you don't have to necessarily sit on a cushion. And, and the key, I think the key word that you said in there is attentional flexibility. Yeah. So if I were to really pare down what's different in, in your languaging than a lot of the langu- languaging that's out there around mindfulness is that this goal of attentional flexibility, the goal is not to slow our lives down so that we're walking in mindful meditation through our lives. We're not Buddhist monks, but really to know when it's beneficial to walk slowly and when we need to freaking run (laughs) and, and having, and not being so caught up in our heads about rules of how it should be, or even this new rule that we all need to be meditating and slow and, and present. You talk about even sometimes it's okay to not be present and mind wandering. Well, and you know, so it, what you want to do is have that on a leash, have it under control so that you can use it as a skill to fit, the purposes of the moment. And there's some things you you see when you start thinking about attentional flexibility. I'll give you an example. I have a little uh, exercise I I, I talk about in in the book where uh, in airports, I'll begin to notice as many people in the airport and their interrelationships as I can at one moment. And when you do that, you start seeing things flowing. It's like looking at a river. When you're walking along in, in a relatively crowded, for hundreds of yards, you can see people. Now, here's what I suggest people do. Start walking side to side instead of just forward. Go forward, but just suddenly start taking weird routes. You're going to see people hundreds of yards away adjusting to you. It's like, you're going to see expressions face. Your people be concerned. What are you doing? What do you do? I mean, you are so interconnected. We are all so interconnected when we're driving, when we're talking, when we're walking, and we're missing it. And, I, and it's, it's not that we have to focus on that. I'm just saying sometimes, like at a business meeting, do this at your next staff meeting. Watch all the people at the table at once. And you'll see ripples of laughter move through, a smile, a cough, a yawn. You'll see different teams. There's actually interconnections going on, exchanges and glances. Well, why would you do that? It's because when your attention can be flexible, fluid, and voluntary, you can deploy it to fit the needs of the situation. And so that skill gets built. It's like a muscle being practiced for when you need it. And sometimes focusing, sometimes shifting, sometimes broadening, sometimes narrowing. Uh, And then all of that fits together just as you notice your emotions within, you notice your thoughts within, you can apply, apply the same skills. There's a spoken word artist named Kate Tempest. And she writes about, or she speaks about how we spend a lot of time. She says, she says, hackles up, head down, and back against the wall. Mm -hmm. And then she also says, there's so much peace to be found in other people's faces. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, that's what mindfulness also offers, right? Because when you're describing the airport examples, to see someone else's face. Right. And yeah. see how you're interconnected with with their with their face and their movements. And when we have our hackles up and our head down and our back against the wall, we miss out on stuff big time. And I don't want to miss out on my kids or my mom or, you know, my clients. Right. Because I'm so um, braced against the present. Yeah. Well, you've given a good example of, of being able to work on attentional flexibility by what we focus on with following the breath. I often We'll ask people to notice that there's a place at the top of the breath where you're not breathing in or out. It's not very long, but it's just flat. And the same thing at the bottom. And 
And it's been there for every single freaking breath you've taken in your life. And people often find it like a revelation. There's like a flat spot at the top of my breath. So it means there's lots of information. Somebody's done the math. I think it's uh, Mark Manson of what percentage of the things our sensory system is giving us that we actually have access to in any given moment. And it's like a tenth of 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 a percent. And no, I don't want access to everything. And I want a broader access. And there's neurobiological studies showing that when you engage in some of these flexibility processes, they actually open up the connectivity so that sensory and sensory motor information is more available to us. As for example, we stop dominating with the conceptual self. And there's these horrifying data on how even what your fingers and eyeballs are giving you is being filtered out by the story you tell about the person you are. So we've, we've touched on presence. Mm-hmm. We've touched on values. We've touched a little bit on self. You were just talking about self when you were talking yeah. about perspective taking. Uh, we've touched on diffusion. And another important component of ACT is committed action or action. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting because what you write about in this book is how ACT can not only, is not only just used for things that we suffer from, but also to increase performance. I've used ACT oh, yeah. with a, a fun, like in fun ways, like working with a kid to study for the MCAT, working with a woman to learn another language because she fell in love with somebody in Europe, uh, working with a young woman to, to quit her job and build a startup, you know, all these things that are life promoting, life enhancing. Can you talk about how this plays out in the research and, and what it looks like, how to use ACT in this way? Well, it's a really exciting how it sort of broadens out. And really, we're, we're interested in ameliorating problems, but we're also interested in promoting prosperity and performance. And it turns out the same processes help you do that. And, you know, I was in Rio. My, my wife is Brazilian and actually saw people win gold medals there who have ACT coaches. I tried to get them to talk for a liberated mind, like, just couldn't do it because they usually try to keep that a little bit private. Um, but uh, the CEOs of Fortune 100 companies, same thing. But we, I did talk about the underlying research on sports and business and leadership. And there was just a review in Success Magazine. I thought, this is cool. The first review of the book is in Success Magazine because people see, you know, performance. You get in your own way with these difficult thoughts, feelings, etc. Or just with your conceptual self, just normal functioning, you'll let that clown suit get in the way of being able to be an effective leader and really hear what the people you're working with need and being able to be there for them emotionally and lift them up as human beings, get the team focused on their values. But the question you asked uh, uh, about performance and uh, committed action, what you're committed to in an ACT model is values-based behaviors and building habits of values-based action that are larger and larger. And there's some things in there. Uh, One of the things that is in there is allowing certain kinds of skills where competence can only be learned this way to be learned by trial and error. You used the metaphor earlier that I'd used in the book of pivoting being like turning on the ball of a foot. And I point out to folks how easy it is for this just, just to make that turn, but also how many times did you have to fall before you learned to do that? And it's thousands of times, thousands. And even when you started to learn, we call people toddlers because they can't pivot. They, they kind of rock, ding, 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 to make a little right angle turn. Because it turns out this is a really hard skill. But you can go to the kitchen and do a pirouette in front of your refrigerator without any difficulty at all. Because you've practiced it. Uh, I'll give an example since we're both in the, in the mental health and helping profession area. If you work with students, they never want to show you their tapes, and especially not the ones where they didn't do well. Their therapy tapes. Yes. yes of course. <laughs> so here's the model of learning. I'll be a good therapist because I sprung forth from the head of Zeus. That's the freaking model that we're trying to make work. No, that's not going to be the way. Nobody learned 
to be a good therapist because, you know, the deity gave birth to them. You are going to be, as my mother used to say, a verstunkene therapist, Yiddish for stinking, until you learn how to be better. And you're going to start with awkwardness and, and with you know, not knowing what to do. Is it okay? We'll do it in a safe place. We'll do it with supervision. We'll put a safety net. We'll even have protocols, things you can follow initially until you have that skill to really dance with your clients. Well, but here's, here's the tricky part though, Steve, is that 15 years out, you're still going to feel like you're a crappy therapist. Yeah, (laughs) That's the secret. (laughs) I have this conversation with my supervisees all the time. They come in and they say, I'm terrible. I'm, you know, I'm horrible. And I, and I, I tell them, I just looked at my docket of the six, seven people that I'm going to see today. And I have doubts about my skills for a large portion of them. When I was, when I was a graduate student 10, 15 years ago, it was 100%. (laughs) I've had some improvement, but, but that's the other thing that's, that's freeing is that I can have this conversation with them. And then we can talk about committed action and I still show up and I, and I, yeah, I have these incremental improvements, but man, I'm not going to let that determine whether or not I'm going to be a therapist. Well, and even more than that, sometimes you can bring that uncertainty into the room in a way, not compulsively out of the way of getting reassurance, but in a way of getting connection that brings you down into human level with the client and your outcomes are going to be better. You know, like I'm really not sure exactly what to say here. But I tell you what, you know, I get a sense of how important this is. And let's see if you and I can walk through this together. Well, you're bringing your own insecurities or into it, and it's a form of connection. You know, if you have somebody uh, that you haven't had a deep conversation about their own their vulnerabilities, and it's somebody who's safe enough that you can do this, like a, a friend but not a close friend or something, open up a conversation by including a little bit about what's going on when, within you and I bet you you'll get people stepping forward that'll they'll talk about what's going on within them. And here's what happens. You feel more connected to them. You feel more able to have that next conversation. And so this cl- crazy idea that we're going to just be like super uh, heroes from day one actually builds walls between us and others. So back to the, pivot, the pivoting toddling kind, kind of example, what we actually do as I have some exercises in the book to, of breaking things down into really, really small things and then pulling out some of the things that would get in the way of values-based commitments. So, for example, uh, if part of what might get in the way is the yearning for applause, for achievement, for, uh, you know, maybe we can do some of these uh, things in ways that don't uh, bring immediate public attention to us that we do it like if we're working on being more attentive and kind to others maybe we could start out with some really small things that are entirely secret and nobody will know you're the one who did that kind of thing do you see what, what the, the sense of it if you have a, a a goal and you have an idea that's kind of a big chunk but you're not sure you can do it well let's divide it by two and then divide it by two it again and now we're down to something that's so small that your mind says, oh, that won't matter. And you can kind of say, yeah, that's right. I'm just, <laughs> but it, it's my practice, you know, where you, you've got these little micro things with no excuses. At the same time, there are times for bold actions. There are times for a commitment that is, that it, that is all at once. If you're going to ask somebody to merit you, I don't suggest you do that in micro steps. Uh, you know that in that if you're going to change jobs, I don't success suggest that you do that in micro steps. If you can ask Steve Hayes to be on your uh, podcast, you just send that an email. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You you leap out, but what you can do is you can practice leaping where you don't know what the outcome is under controlled circumstances that are smaller. You can get comfortable with that, and you know, and with a parachute on, you know, leaping off the, the desk may take you to a place where I can leap out of the plane. And so sometimes, you know, the challenges of life are really those kind of bold moves. And so I like that mix of very small steps linked to a, a larger agenda and bold moves. And one of the things we see in the research that distinguishes ACT from other approaches is if you slip, you stand back up and you do it again. You know, in our smoking trials and our drug addiction trials, if you look at what's happening, you know, at two months or three months, sometimes it looks like we're actually worse off. You look at one year, we're better off. 
And it's be- and why? Because slip, oh, I can't do it. Oh, see, there I'm a failure is a very common pattern. If you're pursuing a values-based pattern, when you slip, it's like a toddler falling on their on their rear end. They get up and they take that next step. And if your values haven't changed, when you've slipped, right back to, okay, now I learned from that one, next trial. And over and over again. I want to throw a big problem at you. Uh, yeah. So I've been hearing more and more stories of people coming into therapy because okay. they're feeling a sense of anxiety and doom about the future in the world. I mean, the Amazon is burning, Steve Hayes. <laughs> the Amazon is burning, right? And, and, yeah. and last night, um, or actually two nights ago, my son and I were reading sure. Harry Potter, and he, he said to me, Mom, what happens when the ice ca- caps melt? Is Santa, what's going to happen to Santa Barbara, right? Like these are questions that our kids are having, that we're having, that we're being flooded with. And I'm, I'm wondering if you had a, a client come into therapy yeah. with you or better yet your own kid, how would you address these kinds of existential fears that we have about the state of the world? Well, you've got two things in there. And if I can be permitted a little bit of excursion, I'll come back to what you asked because of the two things. You asked something about how do you step up to the fear, this almost existential angst of of a world that's rapidly changing and feels out of control and headed in the wrong direction in so many areas. And then you've got the other question of how can we take these processes Mm -hmm. and bring them together to engage in common action that might actually deflect that and change that and do something about the uh, you know, the immigrant crisis or the climate change crisis or the spread of, uh, of uh, you know, prejudice and stigma and the rise of Nazism and the horrible things like that. We've linked up uh, ACT with these social change processes, and I talk about it in a liberated mind, uh, a, a, a set of processes drawn from Eleanor Ostrom, who won the Nobel Prize for showing that indigenous peoples can control the depletion of their forests, lakes, fisheries, streams very well without government intervention and without private ownership, but only if they organize the groups in particular ways. And I'll leave that to, to, to readers, but it's an exciting thing called ProSocial. I have a book coming out on it in October. And if we have one more successful randomized trial, it will be the first World Health Organization protocol disseminated to deal with the immigrant uh, crisis and the challenges it presents. But now coming back to the existential thing, maybe I can tell a story with one of my own children. Um, My uh, son uh, came to me, I think when he was 10, might've been 11. Please don't judge him what I'm about to say because it'd be very unfair. This is very normative. But he's saying to me, you know, dad, I'm wondering in the end, everything dies. And, Why does life matter? Why shouldn't I just kill myself? And I said, I'll tell you what, why don't we do this? How about if we assume that in the end, everything dies? It either is going to expand indefinitely and gradually go dark, or if there's enough dark matter, gravitational pull will pull all back together in infinitely dense P from which it'll explode again for the infinite number of times. Now, does either of one of those sound very meaningful to you? I said, so let's just start with this. It's empty and meaningless. And he looked at me like, oh, what? And then I looked at him and I said, but I want to tell you something else. I love you and you love me. And I know that. And that's as real as our next breath. You know, so he came back years later and said it was a pivot point in his young life. And not that I'm trying to treat, you know, prove to him that life's empty and meaningless, but here's what I'm doing with that. I'm not going to fight your mind over, you know, oh, prove to me that life's worth living. That's a fool's errand. You can trump that. You just say, so what, every single time, and you'll trump that. But there's something else going on here. You're a human being who yearns to love and contribute, to uplift, to live a values-based life. That's a fact. And what, you don't get to have that fact just because Mr. Dictator Within has given you, you know, science facts to worry about? Yes, you do. And now, is there enough caring? Is there enough love? Is there enough values in the world that we can deflect 
some of these terrible trends that are happening? I don't know. But let's put it loose and find out. And I know for sure, if we don't dig down to that part of us that knows how to care and to organize our behavior around it, we for sure will not succeed with these challenges we have in front of us worldwide. One last question is um, yeah. a selfish context or a self question. So I, I go on this morning run on the, on the weekends where I run up this hill and it's sort of like a mountain. It's pretty isolated and steep. And along the way, I'll come across other runners and there's, a, there's motivation in, in meeting another runner. And we're like, oh, this is painful, right? And you can relate to them and feel that and see that in their face. And then, but, but what really encourages me is the folks that are on their way down. So the, the riders and the runners that are coming down and I look in their faces and they give me encouragement and they also give me this, I know and it's worth it, look, right? So you're 71 and I'm 40. Right. And hopefully, we know you've been to the top and hopefully you're enjoying a bit of the ride down. What, if you were to come across yourself coming down and see yourself at 40, (laughs) see your own face, but what would be some of the encouragement or advice you'd give him? Well, uh, you know, these all sound like cliches. And there's a reason for that. Uh, you're not the first runner. Your your life, your life's run sits atop thousands of generations of people who lo- love and lost, who who did the best they could, and who created a world in which you and I can talk, you know, across great distances instantly through the internet and stuff. Things that were just unimaginable even when I was a kid. And the words that show up are are things like, you know, love is what matters, or just be yourself, or uh, keep the faith. You know, I I think if I could have a conversation with myself at 40, I would say, I like what you're doing, dude. And my suggestion to you is to show up and to be kind to yourself and yeah, keep moving, but not because you're going to earn something, but just because you're going to learn something. And I don't know if it would be heard, but actually that 40 year old did a pretty good job. I mean, I'd see a lot of inefficiencies and a lot of mistakes and relationships lost and opportunities missed. And I feel badly about that. But the very fact that I feel badly about that is part of why I think I'm doing a little better. You know, I I, I watched, um, can I tell a little personal story? I, I watched uh, for the first time the Dead Poets uh, Society last night with my son and uh, and my wife. And, and I woke up at uh, about an hour and a half later, uh, wide awake and at the edge of tears, if you know that movie. You know, the. I don't want to take things away. People haven't seen it, but there's a horrifying thing that happens at the end that just rips your heart out. And I was trying to, oh, golly, I'm going to have a hard time doing this without crying. I'm trying to explain to my wife this morning how that landed for me, and I found myself weeping over this movie. Um, and, you know, I, I've been like that my whole life. and. A lot of where I went with anxiety disorders was to try to cover that part over. But it's the part that actually helps me when I'm in there with a client. And I can feel pain. And I can connect with it in a way that uh, sometimes allows me to be useful to them. And so, uh, you know... I, the whole thing of experiential avoidance, why is that so central? Not because I'm so great at it, but because I'm so clear how I'm not great at it. You know, I'm still I'm 71 years old. I'm, you know, getting up and, you know, m- making myself some tea during the movie. Why? Because I can't, almost can't stand it because I know it's coming. You know what I mean? So, so here's the thing. If somebody, if I look at myself as a 40-year-old, I would see way more how much is ahead 
if I look at myself as a 70 year old, I'd say that, but here's, I know my baseline. And so I don't compare myself to the Dalai Lama. I compare myself to a person who was so full of anxiety and panic that I couldn't give a talk to five undergraduates. And, and so against our own baselines, would it be okay for us to view ourselves as a work in progress? And that we're, there's no finish line, we're not gonna get a blue ribbon, there's not the little plaque, there's just one small step at a time getting bigger and kinder and more open. And I know I have so much further to go. And so I don't kind of feel like I'm downhill other than my whole physical part. I'm just still running up the hill and trying as best I can to be present and maybe even be able to watch Dead Poets Society without getting up and faking that I needed to get some tea because I knew it was coming. For those that are wanting more and want to get your book, we're, we're doing a uh, a bit of a giveaway here uh, on Psychologists Off the Clock. So we talked about that earlier, but also I know that you've done some giveaways in terms of resources and freebies. Can you tell us what you have out there for people that order? Yeah. Well, just, so there's, some, there's one that's really sweet. If people go to uh, my website, stephenchays.com, and then forward slash a liberated mind, I think there's a link there that will help you find that easily. Um, if you've bought the book, we'll send you these things. By the way, I don't put you into a funnel. I don't capture your email. Nothing's going to happen. You're not going to get spam from me. It's just so that I can have the email to give you the, the, the thing. And so you'll get a link over to an app toolkit that has a whole lot of things you can try that are very kind of micro things that you can, you can do. You can get some, a link to some things where you can look at your own flexibility scores. How are you, how are you doing? There's a tape from me kind of walking through the, some of my own personal story and uh, how it landed with this book. But then there's the thing I'm most excited about is my 28 year old did a, a, an illustrated act in a nutshell book. It's only 12 pages long, but she came up with these images that show the six flexibility and inflexibility processes. And I think they're just brilliant. I mean, she's, awesome she went to the Rhode Island School of Design she's an awesome artist she's now learning script writing uh, in a, a master's program at, uh, to teach that at Colorado State but she consented to do some of her visual uh, uh, art for the book and uh, I'm really proud of it these images stay in your head you just got to see the dictator within the way she it. it will stay in your head and if you can't relate to it, uh, maybe this book you can't relate to either because the images speak to you. So we'll link to all of that in, in the show notes so people can can go there and get those wonderful resources. Uh, so Steve Hayes, it's been a pleasure and a privilege to be in your presence. Thank you for coming on the show. And this is a great day, the release of your new book. So go out there and go get it. It in, honestly order of five, because you're going to want to uh, put them on people's bedside tables <laughs> that you think <laughs> would benefit from this. So thank you so much. It was awesome. I had a great time with you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. You can find us on iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you are having a mental health emergency, please dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources on our webpage. Our website is www.offtheclockpsych.com. That's www.offtheclockpsych.com.